Hi and welcome to Insights with Net Support Corporate Edition. Today I am so excited to be speaking with one of my actual sheroes, uh, Kat Wildman, who is the founder of Powered by Diversity, which she will explain a little bit about in a moment. Um, but our main topic today is that we're going to be looking at DEI data and also overcoming the fear that might come along with that, because sometimes just the word data makes people sweat um, or switch off. But it can be a really useful tool when utilised properly. Um, and actually, there are so many benefits from us kind of taking on that data and running with it. So to go into some more detail, I'm going to bring on Kat. Welcome, Kat. It's so lovely to have you here. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. How are you? How's your week been so far? I am very well. Yeah, the week's been good. Week's been good. Weather's been a bit up and down, but yeah, generally can't complain. No, it's nice today as well. So that's always a bonus. So <sighs> would you mind just starting by introducing yourself to everyone, please? Yeah, absolutely. So hello, everyone. I'm Kat Wildman. I am founder of a company called Powered by Diversity. I am a scientist and technologist, so woman in STEM representing. Um, I was <laughs> a, a director in, of technology at the time that the Gender Pay Gap Reporting Initiative came out. And I used to do digital products, and that was my thing. I mean, I still do. Um, and because I used to go on about women in STEM and diversity, inclusion, equality, all that uh, for so long, when the Gender Pay Gap Reporting Initiative came out, everyone in the boardroom sort of looked in my direction to solve the problem. <laughs> what are we going to do about our gender pay gap that we have to report in one year? And so I, this, and that's where it all started because I started researching what do we actually do about this situation? You know, I couldn't in reality do anything unless I had baselined and had a look at all the things that could potentially be barriers for all the different protected groups measured how we as a company were doing against each one of those and I went out to market looking for this thing that I could use to do that and it didn't exist and I was like am I really gonna go and make this thing uh, and I yeah, did yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it I love that it's not there so I'll make it <laughs> yeah that's great. And then obviously it's grown from that. So tell us a little bit more about Power by Diversity. Yes. So it very quickly became clear to me during our organizational research phase. We did research with organizations, with desk based research, with the actual research that had been done. And then we did qualitative research with protected groups. And during the organization phase, when I was talking to all these different kinds of organizations, it became very clear to me that there was a huge problem with. EDI data and getting mm. the diagnostic detail being really financially prohibitive mm. for so many different organizations. It was basically really expensive consultants. And I understand mm. the consultants need to make a salary and they're self employed, and that's absolutely yeah, fine. Of course. What that means is that there's so many organizations, charities, small companies, startups, medium enterprises who don't have the massive budget to be able to spend mm -hmm. on a consultant and the number of days that they would need to go around and qualitatively get all that data and then write a report, etc. I just thought we need to do it for that underserved group. Mm -hmm. So we Making are it more accessible, isn't it? Exactly. That's it. And so we work with a lot of charities, third sector, SMEs, that's our major. We major on mm -hmm. SMEs and when smaller companies come to us and they're like, oh, we're only 70 people, you know, is this gonna work for us? Like 70 people, that's that's in our sweet spot, you know, that's yeah. our own zone, it will be perfect for you. Mm. Um, uh, and it's so affordable that they often can't believe the price of it, but that's what we wanted to do. So we were dedicated yeah. to, you know, making everything financially accessible. We also do training, we've got an ambassador certification program and we've got the cultural calendar club yeah tell me a bit more about the cultural calendar club it's really exciting oh so the cultural calendar had been annoying me all last year <laughs> <laughs> but not now right <laughs> yeah, in 22 being really annoyed about the cultural calendar <laughs> Just because so many people i'm loving the honesty <laughs> people would come to me and they would be like we've got budget for a speaker for international women's day and pride month and then mm -hmm. no more budget and i'm thinking well, what about all the other stuff? You know, what so about much, isn't there? Exactly. exactly. And, and also, it was annoying me that everyone was complaining about companies posting, you know, performatively on LinkedIn about things like International Women's Day, Black History mm. Month. The kind of biggies. Exactly. But what actually the solution they were left with when they spent all their bu budget on, you know, two 
cultural calendar days, that is the only solution they had. And, and mm. then in speaking to HR directors, they were saying to me, oh my gosh, we actually can't keep up because this cultural calendar, like managing this cultural calendar is a full-time job for someone. And it's also mm. really expensive. So I just yeah. thought, what can we do to actually change this whole situation so mm. we created a year of the the idea came to me on the 15th of december 2020 and i'm like oh, oh good timing for the for 2023 then <laughs> exactly. but i just got off on some on on a christmas holidays and my kids had just broken up from school and everyone was winding down and i was like why now i've hardly got any time to do this i'd need to launch on the first of january <laughs> I was just like, oh, come on, brain. You could have given me a couple of months notice. But no, we launched on the 1st of January uh, mm -hmm. as, as an experiment. And so we had, I between then and New Year, got all of our speakers together from our collective and just said, right, cultural calendar, who wants a speaking slot? What day mm -hmm. would you like to speak on? What's your topic? Send me a picture. Stuck it up online. Put it all, yeah. you know to the website made this cultural calendar you know and, and it was a hope and a you mm -hmm. know let's throw it out there and see what happens and it's been so unbelievably popular that everyone's like oh my god this is the answer to my prayers and I'm thinking yeah. think of this earlier we could have been mm -hmm. doing this ages but it's a kitty model so if you want 20 places on every single event for 12 months so from July to July we've got 21 events I think yeah um on all sorts of different topics, ranging from awareness to workshops to mm. storytelling on all these different protected characteristic themes, then for 20 places on all those events, it's a thousand quid. So mm -hmm. it's like, oh wow, that's literally the price of one talk, you know? In yeah, I mean, yeah, it easily can be. <laughs> yeah. you know? So that's mm. it, that's the cultural calendar, the whole financially accessible thing, I think is mm. our, Bit that sits, sits as a well, I think also it's taken away that kind of that time to research to find the right speakers to book them to organize it blah 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 it's it's already there it's a schedule you just book you know what you want and who you want there that's um, it exactly you know, and it makes a lot of sense poor HR directors and SMEs who've been doing yeah this stuff, exactly in addition to all the other stuff they need to do yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all the like day to day every in and out you know there's so much isn't there so yeah, yeah having that one less thing to organize is probably quite exactly and it's a big thing as well that's mm. off their plate and then they they can focus on right okay we've done this event it's this day in the cultural calendar what are we then going to do as an organization yes, exactly and instead of spending all of their energy and time and you know emotional brain space thinking of you know events to put on they're like okay mm -hmm. great we've all seen that event what can we do how can yeah we what we're going to get from it yeah, yeah. Exactly. exactly yeah that's awesome I love that um so today we were going to really dive into EDI data so the first thing I think I wanted to ask because I think that would be really helpful for the general discussion is what sort of data do we want to see organizations collecting that will be really useful for them making their workplaces more inclusive Oh my gosh, that is such an important question. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> I'll give a big one to start with, but I think it's key for sure. <laughs> definitely, definitely. If there's one thing I could change about the world, actually, it would be this thing that I'm about to say. So don't, please, please don't go out to your organizations and ask them to tick boxes about their protected characteristics. Mm -hmm. That is the absolute worst thing that you can do. It's often the place where everybody starts and they're like, oh my gosh. We need to do EDI. I need to find out what we're dealing with here in terms of diversity. Mm. I'm going to make a pie chart. And um, so they'll go out and they'll ask people to tick boxes about themselves. So mm. what we researched this and we found that because they were getting such low engagement rates, we we never did that. Mm. But we wanted to be able to prove to them that it was a bad That's idea. That's not the way to go about it. Yeah. Yeah. So it leaves people generally feeling negative and they split into three groups. So mm. the first group is those who tick quite a few diversity boxes and so they reported back feeling like oh my gosh are you going to be done now you know if there's quite a few of us are you going to be like oh okay we're done are mm. you going to walk me out to speak about my protected characteristics all the time am I going to have to yep. share this stuff um and, am and I going to be a sort of symbol of the company the of diversity you know like oh look we have a disabled person at work that's great you know is it just like a, a showing of off sort of thing rather than actually supporting exactly yeah are you just going to take a photo mm -hmm. and maybe do a profile on our recruitment page and yeah. then just actually all my you know needs and wants um mm -hmm. so that was that group <clears throat> 
The second group are those people who don't tick very many diversity boxes mm -hmm. at all. So you're launching this in the context of EDI is really important to us. Diversity is really important to us. Please tick these boxes about yourself. And that mm -hmm. is all the context that this group are getting. And so yeah. they're thinking, oh my gosh, I'm not ticking many boxes at all. Yeah. What How am I? Does yeah. it mean I'm not valuable anymore? Yeah. What about the value that I bring? What about, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that I do a great job? And they are a really dangerous group because mm -hmm. they, they become scared. And so fear will drive them to bad behavior sometimes. Yeah. So, you, you know, best case, they'll disengage. Mm -hmm. uh, go, Do you know what? EDI, whatever. What a waste of time. This is such a distraction. You know, we've heard mm -hmm. all of those things before. And it's mm -hmm. usually for them who don't take that many Exactly. Because yeah. they're afraid of their position. They're afraid that if EDI happens, they will not be happening anymore. So they'll, mm -hmm. they'll be sidelined. Um, so they it's that could fear of the, like positive discrimination almost, isn't it? Exactly. Where the companies so, will be too selective rather than thinking about the person for the job and how they work and all that kind of stuff going into the ticking boxes. Exactly. But it's not all, it's not, yes, protected characteristics are important, but also it's not valuing the difference that that person brings. So yes. Yes, yeah, exactly. Characteristics, like if you're from an underrepresented group and you've had a different background, a different upbringing, different culture, different life experiences, and you face different barriers, your input is going to be really valuable in a place where someone else has had totally different. Because when yeah. you come together to try and innovate, to try and find solutions, problem mm -hmm. solve, great things will happen because this person will be like, oh, what about this? And this person will be like, oh my gosh, I never thought about that. Mm -hmm. That's the whole point of bringing difference into an organization. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and you know, the people who don't take many protective characteristic boxes can still bring difference. Yes. They can be yeah, introverts, extroverts, they could be reflectors or activists, they could be, mm. you know, outside the box thinkers, big picture thinkers or really small detail person, they could be disagreeers mm. as opposed to agreeers, you know, they could be the, the red hat in the room type thing. It's yeah. not looking at the whole person, it's just looking mm. at those those aspects of them so and then what's the third group then so obviously we've got the tick a lot not tick much at all where are we? Yeah. what's the third, the third group, group is the ones who have not haven't come out so mm. you could not be open about a lot of things so you could have hidden disabilities you could have a, a secret parental status you could yep. be trying for a baby you could have a hidden uh, neurodivergence that you haven't declared at work. Your orientation is not visible on the outside. Mm. Uh, there's so many different things that people, you know, don't have to tell. And yes. it's the absolute last place that they are going to come out about those things for the it's first a time. Sheet. <laughs> exactly. The exactly. Work, yeah. So even if you're going with no context either, mm. no. You know, if you tell us this, we will X, we will support mm -hmm. you by or it's in conjunction with mental health support week. So tell us, you know, do you have a mental health condition that you want us to know about? Mm. It's contextless. And yeah. so they're going, there's absolutely no, prefer not to say, prefer not to say. Yeah. To say. I can completely relate to that because I've, I've had forms like that in the past where I've never like declared my dyspraxia on it because I'm always like, I don't know if this is going to change how they respond to me and how they act because I don't there are certain things that I don't need that I'm worried they'll just kind of throw at you you know like a, oh you have this so you need this this and this or we're gonna you know like you say put you on this poster or whatever and it's like just felt without context it felt irrelevant it's like it's got nothing to do with my job or how I would perform so why do I even have to check it off and that's kind of I'd always switched off to those kind of things in the past exactly. that is it that is it it's suspicion that group is yeah. just suspicious massively and so when if you go out and do that you, though you potentially agitating those three groups mm. being really negative for lots of different reasons there's a lot of people who just won't engage because they'll be like yeah. but why which is the key thing yeah. of if you're not launching with a why so our thing is we have the why because you've just told us all of your thoughts and feelings and beliefs about every single different aspect about you in the workplace, the workplace and you, the leadership, the values, your feelings of pride, your feelings of inclusion, belonging, where you've been held mm. back, professional opportunities, training, what you'd like to see, all these different things. You're so much more inclined because yes. the questions are so diagnostic to go, do you know what? I am female. I am between, you know, 40 yeah. and 50. I, I am a parent. I do have mm. a hidden disability. I am neurodivergent all of these different things you know that you will go I want you to know because I've just raised a massive flag and actually got the thing off my chest that I wanted to tell yeah. you therefore our declaration rates are massively high 
the other mm. thing is they're anonymous as well. Yes. So, yeah, I think that's a huge factor as well, isn't it? Having that anonymity yeah. because, yeah, especially like you say, for the groups that are not wanting to check off, if it's anonymous, it's far more likely they'll go, okay, yeah, because I, I want to add this data that's going to mean that we're going to get more support for this or that, um, you know, one of the groups that I sit within is going to be better represented at work or you know so that exactly. that makes a lot of sense exactly that's it so you do still need to gather that demographic data but what we recommend to people is that one you'll have it off the back of having done our assessment two is get it during the recruitment the hiring process and mm. then create the environment for everyone else create the environment of inclusion whereby they feel like they want to voluntarily give that information and don't try and force it don't try and like yeah. bring out of people and like harangue people until your engagement rate is you know mm -hmm. whatever because what you'll tend to find is when you look into that data we had an organization they were like oh we've got 46 percent enga engagement which is better than the 20 whatever percent they'd had mm -hmm. the previous year and I was like well come let's have a look at the data and it was prefer not to say it's yeah. like well people are engaging so you stop harassing them yeah when they feel they have to do it they're really not giving you any information mm -hmm. exactly if you create the environment that they know they are safe and protected and actually their opinion will be used for good and that mm -hmm. why is so compelling they're like I trust that this is the right thing to do for me mm -hmm. And for for the greater good of my protected character, character. So, would you say for people to understand the why is more important than the specific things that you're collecting, so that uh, you're getting that more authentic data, basically? Yeah. So, with if you if you want to gather that demographic data, you need to make your why the most compelling thing in the world. Mm. Like invest good time and money in creating that why whether you have a day of people speaking whether you have a, a whole thing if that's the only thing you're going to do is gather your demographic data invest in the why and really convince mm. people that they need to engage with this but are uh, if you if you want to give them a why you can ask them relevant questions about their experience in the workplace and then yeah. ask them their protected characteristics anonymously and you mm. will get the same result you know that is your why yeah. this is why we want to know because we want to make the world a better place for you yeah not just the demographics of no context yeah like if you're why is because i want to make a pie chart that is just mm. that'd be like no <laughs> the other thing i wanted to ask you as well was with that data that you're collecting i think i know i've spoken to nick about this a lot before is that the protected characteristics is very narrow and i think there are a lot of kind of different groups and different vulnerabilities that are not covered uh what kind of extra things do you think is often missing from that kind of data that people are collecting yeah so that's a great question as well um lots of employee surveys and, and demographic stuff doesn't include socioeconomic status which mm -hmm. is really really important to us so social mobility and socioeconomic status i feel like should be protected characteristics yeah i'm um, really surprised it isn't to be honest because it can make a huge difference to someone's daily life and experiences and, and their opportunities yeah, for absolute sure. If you're looking, if you're genuinely looking at where you have gaps in inclusion in the organisation, you've got to be looking at socioeconomic status. Mm -hmm. And that, the way we do it, is it's self-declared, and yeah. we ask people why they consider themselves to have come from low socioeconomic status or currently be. Mm -hmm. And it's things like you know, you could be a single parent, it could be economic factors, it could be your accent, it could be the fact that English is not your first language. Mm -hmm be you know the fact that you've held refugee status in the past it could be loads of things yeah. any situation where you wouldn't hold the same cultural capital or the same social capital or mm. economic capital as someone else in the organization and therefore you know be open to potential barriers being there mm. then people should be allowed to self-declare it's not necessarily just about free school meals or your parents yeah. it's a lot deeper education. than that isn't it a lot deeper yeah um we also look at single parents because I mean, the load on single parents in trying to oh, it's huge. the world is just astronomical. When you think that's a group in particular that would really benefit from like flexible working opportunities and that kind of thing as well. So being able to know um, who kind of has those statuses and what could really support them. Yeah, the absolutely. That is it. And looking at how you could, you know, subconsciously and completely accidentally be turning away a whole group of the workforce mm. that want and need to earn money and succeed in Absolutely. their careers yeah um, and there's such small things that you could be doing you know social inclusion wise after mm. work drinks that's just not going to happen it's going to no. be so prohibitive for what about like a barbecue at lunchtime while everyone's already in the office you know or something like that 
that's it. That's it. And even things like the rewards, perks, benefits, and rewards and awards, and the types of events that you're holding, mm. you can gear those so much more to include that that particular protected. Not it's not even a protected group. Single parents is not a protected. Mm. No, which also seems mad but yeah. <laughs> so, um, and we also look at whether people have been pregnant whilst at the organization as mm. well so being able to filter your results on that you can often see massive discrepancies especially in the professional opportunities section where yeah. you, know, you know it happens everyone knows it happens uh, having been pregnant in the workplace three times I know it happened I mean the most outrageous things happened. Oh my gosh, yeah, it's shocking, like, isn't it? Place, uh, like benevolent bias was just massive. Mm. They acted like I was about to drop dead at any point if anything happened. Yeah. They forced me to be sitting down. I'm like, do you know what? I'm I'm good. I can yeah. I can and it's those like here. <laughs> and I've had friends that have said about like the assumptions of about it so like that oh well they're clearly not going to come back to work or you know they're going to be off for however long or rather than actually speaking to them about what they want to do and what their transition back might be like and they might have been more than happy to come back full time but because of the assumption they're like well they obviously don't want me back yes so exactly. they just it. don't that feel is- valued that is for all the things standing in the way of professional opportunities for people who are pregnant mm-hmm. because their life just, their working life just gets put on hold, yeah. usually not by them. Uh, in my first pregnancy, I was sitting at a desk doing some such, I'd just done a huge project, which mm. involved staying up all through the night. And actually it did that well, because we were sending something live uh, and it was a 24 hour technology business. Mm. And I was pregnant then, just nobody yeah. knew. And so yeah. and as soon as they found out I was pregnant, I was put onto this such a boring project where there was nothing mm. to do. I was a I was a director. I was so capable and so bored out of my mind. And I just thought, do you know what? This oh, gosh. Absolutely yeah. doubt on my self-worth. Yeah, because then you're like, why am I here? I might as well have just gone. <laughs> 100%, 100% literally yeah. anyone could do this in fact no one even mm. needs to do this because it's not even no, necessary it's just it's, busy work yes yeah. so the data that comes out from that group is so mm. so important mm. about um do you look at groups like for example I'm thinking like menopause in the workplace as well so we look at menopause in the workplace in terms of age groups mm. um, so we gather people's age ranges it's obviously that is not a catch-all um no. so you can't assume that people I know a lot of people who have gone through medical menopause for example mm, are yeah, earlier than you would expect you know age age related menopause mm. um we don't add it as a protected characteristic um but it's something that we potentially could uh cover mm. in the future however a lot of our recommended re- recommendations a lot of our resources a lot of our events in the cultural calendar are geared towards thinking about yeah. menopause workplace yeah because it's just those working really environments cool. and you know there's lots of things that could be easily done in work environments that aren't um you know and those flexibilities and things that would make a huge difference exactly exactly and even just the understanding mm. of what people yeah. are experiencing and including and- men men being aware as well and understanding I think sometimes yeah. it's yeah. you know that's missed as well isn't it yeah exactly uh, but but a big a huge thing for that is it they could be experiencing nothing so yeah. if you're educated and aware about what menopause means it doesn't mean that every single person is no, you know, exactly using all 70 or so related <laughs> symptoms of menopause. I'd hope not <laughs> it was everyone getting all 70 can you imagine <laughs> oh my gosh um, but, but yeah just, yes. with menopause it's just about the conversation keeping the conversation open and Absolutely. it's that manager employee relationship and the colleagues understanding basically mm. Yeah, I know that makes so much sense. So we talked about kind of the the sort of data you want to collect and and giving that why as well. Um, What's the next step then? Because I think for some companies, they're like, oh, that's great. We've got all our data. We've checked it all off. And then they just sort of get a bit complacent and and don't really do anything with it. Oh, my gosh. No, you've got to act on the data. So that's pointless getting it otherwise, isn't it? (laughs) Because your employees next cycle, they won't engage as much as they did. No, because nothing happened with it. Exactly. <laughs> and they'll feel more negative about the workplace because they'll be thinking, do you know what? I told you all of this stuff. I told you mm. some really deep stuff and you didn't do anything about it, actually. And you never mentioned it again. And I feel like I wasted my time. Yeah. And that's, that can be really hurtful because they like we go really deep and we talk about things. You know, we ask them questions mm. that, you know, they, when you watch people doing it in test conditions, they're like, oh, my gosh. Oh, wow, I've never been asked that before. Well, yeah, actually, Especially if they're asking me. about things like belonging and they say they don't feel they belong and then nothing happens with it. It's like, oh, you just don't care. <laughs> exactly, that's yeah. it. So the most important thing to do is acknowledge people's 
responses, acknowledge the responses. Um, mm -hmm. And then we've got an action planning tool. So every question has recommendations. You add the recommendations to your action plan and then spend the next 12 months. So that whole process only takes mm -hmm. about four weeks. So it's yeah. self-assessment, employee assessment for three weeks, results straight away. So there's no report writing. The, the system does it all for you. Go through it, analyze it, pin recommendations to your action plan, acknowledge your employees' responses, mm -hmm. give out some data, show, present, you know, whatever, and then it's action plan. So the whole rest yeah. of that year should be, right, let's focus on this, let's focus on this, and you spend the next 12 months focusing on actually closing mm -hmm. the gap you found, then measure again the next cycle and report back, okay, you told us this, we did this, this is what the data is now. Wonderful. Mm. Marginal gains. I think a lot of you can actually see the progress. Exactly. Well. Yeah. And and show progress rather mm. than, you know, keeping it all inside because you're afraid that the data isn't good and it makes you look mm. bad. The employees already know. So this yeah, is that's, that's true. It's reflecting what they've said, isn't it? So they must know. <laughs> some this is the funny thing that happens with organizations mm. is that they get the data back and they're like, oh, we can't share this. Oh, my gosh. Like, this is a really bad piece of data. It's mm. like they already know because it's your employees who have yeah. responded in that way it's their comments I mean I get maybe not putting it on the website or something but, yeah. <laughs> but definitely share it with the people that took the time to fill it out <laughs> absolutely and acknowledge that, that you have a problem you know we yeah. asked to find gaps we found a gap and we're going to do something about it even if that is the one thing that you do in the year and you only focus on that thing where you found a big hairy gap that you're thinking oh my gosh I don't want this to get out well great mm -hmm. You know, you found the gap. You don't want it to get out. So let's close it. Let's make marginal gains Absolutely. to close that gap and measure again the next year. Mm. I think it's really key as well what you said about marginal gains. So I think sometimes trying to do like these quick, sudden, swift changes and maybe aren't that sustainable, whereas those smaller changes will kind of make that lasting impact. 100% yes. So a lot of people come to us for the first time and they're, they're, they're coming to us with solutions and mm. they go, we'd like some bystander training please or we'd like some awareness training about topic x and mm -hmm. or, you know, we'd like unconscious bias training and i always say to them why why is it you know why do you mm -hmm. want this tell me about the problem you're looking to solve and they're like oh but we just never have never done it and we really want it or we think you know bystander training will help people to stand up and i'm like do you know the psychological safety situation within your organization have you measured that uh no uh, mm -hmm. and then you know, without psychological safety, if you don't have the environment for people to be able to stand up, you know, have you communicated to them your red lines as an organization? Have you communicated the way you want challenges to be issued? Have you communicated how you're gonna support people who challenge other people um, mm. or who challenge situations? How do you want those challenges to occur? Should they be one-to-one? -one? Do you have facilitation? Are you gonna train people how to have difficult conversations? And they're often mm. like, oh, uh, I don't know, I don't know. But you, mm. you can't just throw bystander training or unconscious bias training at a situation yeah. for the best. But also, how are you going to measure that that training had an impact? You know, that's an investment in everyone's yeah. time. Your money, how are you going to measure? What's that metric that you're trying to pull mm. the lead on? I mean, this is my scientist coming out. I can't, I can't understand yeah. how people would invest in something without being able to measure the impact. Mm. Do you think your um, scientist background as well really helped when you were kind of looking at that, uh, that kind of that measurement of data and the reports and things? Do you think that gave you a real insight into like, right, let's make sure this is actually impactful data by doing X, Y, Z? <laughs> Without a doubt. I just, I've seen so many, so many people come to us and they, they go, they go, either I'm an external consultant, I'm a consultant and, and I've got my own survey. Would you mm. look at it and tell me, you know, if it's good? And then, or an organization come in and go, we did a survey last year. Do you want to see the data? And I'll look at it and be like, oh my gosh, that is a, what, that's such a high level question. Either it's a really high level mm. question. Like, I feel like I belong here, which mm. you cannot act on that piece of information. You can't act on 5% of people don't feel like they belong because mm. belonging is such an under researched thing when i went to write our framework and had a look at you know what actually is belonging what are the metrics underneath that what are the contributing factors how can we make belonging tangible and measure it mm. the research had not been done so we mm. went and did that research as part of our framework writing because you know if you have five percent of people who don't feel like they belong what are you going to do you're going to go and say why do you feel like you don't belong and that's a yeah. load of 
additional labor for you and additional labor for those groups who don't feel like mm -hmm. they belong whereas we find out why they don't feel like, like they belong and what protected groups they're from mm -hmm. therefore you can go you know oh we've got an issue with the social scene in the sales department for our religiously marginalized groups let's have a look sales department what is your social scene like what do you do currently a oh, load of after work drinks you know usually in the pub well mm -hmm. we've got a solution right there straight yeah. away narrow the problem down and it often feels like an absolute no-brainer to solve when you get deep you know detailed mm -hmm. diagnostic data the solution is so much easier than when you get back all this consultant level data which sometimes is written yeah. in computer language it mm. can be like all your psychological that's a really good point actually yeah people even understanding the questions exactly yeah so it's it's very important my scientific background has served me very well and also yeah. I, am a, I am a science geek within myself like it's in mm. my dna i annoy my husband i'm like oh, that's not a very controlled experiment that's a very, that's <laughs> a very controlled piece of data. have you baselined that and he's like oh my gosh you're such a geek. <laughs> so talk to me about the fear because when we were um chatting the other day about doing this podcast you said that there is a lot of fear around the edi and kind of going into data and talking to employees about it what what is this fear and why uh why are we seeing it? Yes, there's two types of fear that we deal with every day. There is the fear that if they do the assessment process, that you know, date things will come out, and mm -hmm. they're like, you know, we've got a harassment, discrimination, victimization section. There is not a single organisation that we've assessed so far where something major has come out that they didn't know about before. Mm -hmm. you know, you get a few you know, low level things happening, but it means that you can then go, oh my gosh, okay, we've got a few issues going on here in this particular, aware department, of it. This particular yeah. group. Let's go and tackle that. But it feels less, it's not a big monster jumping out of the closet. You're like, oh, okay, right. There's a few you know, sexist comments going on in that team, or there's a few racist microaggressions going on in that team. Let's do a bit, you know, let's nip this in the bud now before it becomes a big red line. Mm -hmm. That is often, that's the first fear of like, if we do this, and bad things come out it's going to be really scary but actually mm -hmm. what we say to them is if you know it's already happening if it's happening yeah. it's already happening it's going to be even worse if something major happens and it lands on your desk and you then have to deal with it in a tribunal yeah. disciplinary situation the second fear is that a lot of people have conflated having lived experience of all the protected characteristics with being an edi expert who is allowed mm -hmm. to talk about and you know work on and lead edi and so for that reason people with one two protected characteristics no protected characteristics often feel like they don't have permission to get involved in edi at all which mm -hmm. is the absolute worst thing that people can believe because everyone needs to believe that they are you know a leader in edi everyone needs to have edi as part of their objectives and their you know mm -hmm. the daily life at work needs to be everyone's values um and so that is the other fear that we're tackling so with HR directors and SMEs particularly, so smaller, medium companies, there's mm. this poor old HR director sitting there going, oh my gosh, I've now got to do EDI, it's such a massive topic, and the board is looking at me every time to give an EDI update, but mm. I am so completely terrified of saying the wrong thing, using the wrong word, mm. I haven't had the training, so we created a diversity ambassador certification program to with one outcome, which is to create sustainable confidence in all mm. EDI conversations and yeah. actually do the it's a nine week process an hour and a half a week and they emerge from the end of it feeling super confident because actually mm -hmm. it's about that inner confidence yes you learn some language yes you learn some terms you learn a load of new things where you're like oh my gosh that stat that was really interesting that little mm -hmm. tip thing you know hearing that story changed my perception I didn't really understand that but now I really do but more than that it's it's the mindset of I'm never going to learn all the terms I'm mm. never going to, you know, have an encyclopedia of EDI up to date, you know, lingo in my head or know all the latest information and news on every protected characteristic. But what I what I do have is really good intentions, mm. believe in my good intentions. And for that reason, I feel empowered to be able to ask people, you know, can I just ask your gender identity? Can I ask, you know, what pronouns you use? You know, mm. uh, whatever you need to do, how can I help you with that? Would you like to tell me more about it or should we talk at a different time? You know, all, yeah. all of those different things. How can I ally for you? How can mm -hmm. we best support you with this organization? Can I make any accommodations for you? Often those things are things that people are afraid to say. You know, mm -hmm. Eid Mubarak, you know, <laughs> for, for your for your colleagues celebrating Eid. It's just 
people are so scared to be like, mm. oh, you know, I know that she's Muslim and I know that she's fasting at the moment, but I'm just, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. So I'm just not going to say anything. And mm. the poor colleague is sitting there being like, why is no one acknowledging me? Why have there cupcakes over there? Or why have they said, no, no food in the office. Don't eat yeah. on Zoom call. Like, do you not want to talk to me first and go, mm. you know, what, what can we do to make you feel more comfortable yeah. during this period? Would you like us to not have food in the office? Would you like mm. us to not eat on Zoom calls? You know, oftentimes that person will be like, don't be, don't be ridiculous. It's absolutely yeah. fine. Or, you know, let yeah. me, I would love to understand more. But about appreciate that you asked. <laughs> exactly. yeah. That's it. That's it. So that's the sort of fear it tackles of people mm -hmm basically doing nothing because they're so afraid of doing the wrong yeah, thing. Yeah, that's interesting. And do you think the fear of them doing the wrong thing often comes from when they've not had those lived experiences themselves and they feel like they're kind of, yeah, they're they're scared of like, yeah, like you said, like saying the wrong thing, um, doing the wrong thing because it's more of an alien thing to them? I think that it's a combination of unfamiliarity with a particular mm. protected group and therefore that fear of, you know, you know, there's unconscious bias related to yes. familiarity. Everywhere yeah, there's unconscious there's potential bias. And letting your view of that group and how they will react and respond to you being dictated by every, all the other inputs you've had, you know, books, TV programs, news media. Yeah. And then there's the other aspect, which is following, you know, if you're an EDI professional, you'll be following a lot of activists on social media. You'll be looking at the posts on LinkedIn. You'll be looking at the posts on Instagram, Twitter, and mm. so on. And that group are activists. And so their MO is to be confronting and to be provocative and to be emotional, you know, oftentimes mm -hmm. because they're trying to activate people. That's the whole point. But, you know, your colleague in the office is highly unlikely to be in that frame of mind, highly unlikely yeah. to be an activist. And so that, you know, I've only experienced this group in terms of activists and I'm scared that they're going to react like that to me and they're going to jump down my throat and shout at me in the office and everything's mm -hmm. going to be terrible actually that is so completely unlikely to happen yeah. <laughs> Especially if you go in with you know, a curious and caring mindset of mm -hmm. I, I want to know if there's anything I can do to support you or you know can we have a chat about this sometime yeah. because we've never talked about it you know that sort of thing uh, mm -hmm. and people often leave this the same with all of this stuff it's not rocket science it's just giving people the empowerment and the permission and the tools that they need to be able to go and take that first brave step. And it's not about mm -hmm. leaping out of your comfort zone and going to stand on the stage and giving a talk about anti-racism if you're a white person. Yeah. It's about going over to that colleague in the office and saying, hey, you know, are you okay after the news at the weekend? Like it was mm -hmm. everywhere. Is there anything I can do to support you? Do you want to get a coffee later? It's that, yeah. you know, it's that, it's, it's taking that first small brave step yeah, no, absolutely. That makes so much sense. Thank you so much, Kat. It's been brilliant talking to you. Are there any final thoughts that you wanted to leave listeners with before we wrap up? Yeah, well, I would say uh, don't be afraid of taking that first small brave step. Uh, and th what that first small brave step could be contacting us. So please yeah. do. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure you'll put our contact details on. Oh, Follow yeah, absolutely. Them. Wonderful. And data itself is not scary. Um, so don't be afraid be brave we're here with you the whole way brilliant and what's the best way to get in touch with you I will put it in the notes but just so we put it on audio as well yeah absolutely so you can contact me cat cat at poweredbydiversity.org you can head to our website which is www.poweredbydiversity.org or you can follow us on social media at pb diversity perfect all right thank you so much for your time cat it was brilliant wonderful thank you so much for having me Thank you.